What do we actually mean by trap fall? What is a trap fall? Obviously, this is a metaphor. And it seems to me that this is fairly close to Bibo's, I'm going to call it cul-de-sac, the Americans call it dead end, or Jacques Utsa. Um, in other studies, I think in both philosophy and literary theory, it's called aporia. It's not too far from Zugzwang. It's a situation where one actor has much weaker agency than the other actor if we're talking in, in binary opposition, which is probably no bad thing to do. And what I want to do uh, in, uh, well, I better have a quick look at the time before I exceed it. Uh, what I want to do in, in brief is to put forward an argument to suggest that the relationship between Central Europe and Western Europe is one of trapfall in which the stronger and the weaker party are unable to come to uh, some kind of a, an even, uh, evening out of power. Um, and that has a long-term historical, a long-durée perspective that I think is present today. And these are the, the elements that I want to look at. And obviously, I am informed by the 13 years that I've spent as a Hungarian member of the European Parliament. Now. This is where I look at my notes. Um, I think my starting point is the asymmetry of power. There's always been a symmetry of power. Uh, inevitably, in a particular Kukazel. So I'm, I'm just left with my voice now, am I? <laughs> OK. Uh, you can still hear me. OK, Rembem. Um, so basically, Europe is a particular area which has always been subject to asymmetries of power. And these asymmetries of power in the past uh, have been settled by violence or war. Um, and it seems to me that one of the greatest achievements of Europe, post-1945, is to find ways of dealing with the asymmetries of power through conflict resolution, not involving violence. Now, if we go back to 1945, I'm just old enough to remember this, uh, what we have is a totally traumatized Europe. Both sides of what eventually became the Iron Curtain, Fulton speech. Um, how does one escape the trauma? Now here, um, I'm relying on the work of uh, Piotr Stompka and Jeffrey Alexander, who write about uh, social trauma, the impact of events beyond the control uh, of the agent. And it seems to me, and I'm contracting the argument, is that what the West managed quite successfully to do is to create uh, escapes from trauma. And I think the European integration process is fundamentally about this. It worked very well. If you want to uh, contract it even further, you can see what is European integration about? It's to ensure that there's never going to be another war between France and Germany. Brilliant success. There hasn't been another war between France and Germany. Great. Um, and this, I want to signal at this point that the significance of conflict resolution, I think, is the most important part of European integration. Many people do not agree with me, but as far as I'm concerned, uh, this is where it all begins. Now, if we look at this part of the world, which I'm going to call Central Europe, uh, we can argue with Elamir's spirit on this particular proposition. We, what Central Europe, I would suggest, I would put to you, has is a very long durée experience, going back centuries, of repeated attempts at exogamous transformation, which more than ever, more often than not, takes the form of an imperium, an imperial rule which attempts to enforce its own particular modalities, its own particular order on societies which have different perspectives, different aspirations. Um, I've written about this and indeed, oh yes, I have actually submitted a text. I think I'm the first to do this, but the text is available and I go into this in, in great detail. The outcome of these attempts of exogamous transformation, and I think 
probably the Lucas classic was, is Joseph II's uh, absolutism, which generates a resistance. And it's this resistance to the, the transformative attempts which I think characterize the region and the fact that the attempts to achieve the transformation uh, are never fully successful, which means that there are incomplete, um, indeterminate outcomes, which I think is part of this region's history, which then necessarily means that agency is weak, uh, or the sense of agency, the sense of achievement uh, in this region um, continuously lags behind what Western Europe uh, has or what it thinks it has. These are very much subjective perceptions. Um, about 10 years ago, a volume of work by Bobich Mihai was published with the title Lead Ellen Alash, Be Resistance. You can also translate it as the resistance of flies, but that's just the vagaries of the English or the Hungarian language. Um, now, to my mind, this is quite extraordinary. I do not think that it would be possible to publish a volume of poetry, let's say, by Ted Hughes and call it Be Resistance. Uh, I can't even think of T.S. Eliot, Be Resistance, forget it. Yet this, it seems to me, is, and I'm not even sure that this is all, all that central to Bobbage's work, Resistance, but be that as it may, I use this simply to illustrate the continuous strength of the proposition that power should be resisted and that power is sort of suspect, but certainly if it's exogamous power, it's doubly suspect. So that brings me, as I say, this is a contracted version of what I have to say, uh, to 1989, and which I guess most of us have actually lived through. Um, it seems to me that that's when we begin, or re-begin, relaunch the region's encounter with the West, from which obviously this region was cut off from 1945-47, take your pick. Um, I do not think that this encounter has been particularly successful for all sorts of reasons, and I will go through some of these. Um, basically, I, I know I'm, I'm simplifying, but I think that in the last 13 years of membership of the European Union, but to some extent even before that, what this region has undergone is yet another re-engineering project. The attempt to transform these states into something which is like something else. In other words, the expectations of whether it's Berlin or Paris or London or uh, Amsterdam, or in a way it doesn't really matter. And above all, Brussels, the symbolic Brussels with which we're all familiar and should be stopped, of course. As you know the reference I'm making. So the consequence of this, it seems to me, is that we're living in a world of new and old, old new trap falls. And I've made a list here. Uh, some of these obviously dovetailed with what we heard earlier. Um, the way in which the two parts of Europe have not become one, they continuously suffer from flawed perceptions. The first one I've put down is the false expectations. If we go back 20 odd years, it seems to me there were expectations in this part of the world that we would catch up, we being Central Europe. Now, if you look at the figures, there has been considerable growth in each and every one of the 11 countries that have since joined the European Union, weakest in Romania and Bulgaria. But, you know, compare us with the way we were 15 years ago. So GDP per capita has grown, but not one country of this region has managed to overtake any of the EU 15. 2004 figures, I have to check exactly. Um, Slovenia and the Czech Republic were ahead of Greece and Portugal. Greece, of course, is in a totally disastrous state, so maybe some of the other countries have overtaken Greece. Nothing else. So that the discontinuity of growth has actually meant no catching up. It's an expectation that has not been met. I would say also, second point, mutual incomprehension. Um, a, an anecdote, which anecdotes sometimes do help to illustrate. When I en arrived in Parliament in 2004, some of us took a decision that we would try to set up a working group to work on the unification, 
of Europe's history. So about half a dozen of us sat down, and by strange coincidence, each and every one of us was from a former communist country. Uh, Poles and Balts, and I think there was one in Romania, and I can't remember. Nobody from the EU 15 ever came. Um, dismal failure. You simply can't get the message through. There's a lack of interest. Let me say it's mutual. I mean, what do we know about the history of Portugal? Not a lot. About the history of Ireland or history of Sweden and Norway. So we don't know much about them, but they, I think, know even less. But maybe that's difficult to measure. So this ignorance on the part of the EU 15 is significant precisely because of the asymmetry of power. That there's much greater power, economic power, political power, status power, power in whichever area we want to look at it. Um, and very difficult to bridge that gap in consequence. I'm also very conscious of narratives about Central Europe, which are great gross oversimplifications of the sociological political realities. There are good guys and bad guys. Um, and those are stereotyped. We're not supposed to stereotype countries, but actually we do. Just look at the Western media. The Czechs are generally good guys. I think the Estonians are quite good guys. I'm not so sure that we are, but or the Poles, anyway. Uh, the Romanians, likewise. Uh, the Lithuanians have been in the bad boy corner or two at various different times. Utpats? What do you utmash Utpats? Uh, I'm coming to an end. Um, there is this general sense, which I encounter quite frequently, the sense, well, why can't the Central Europeans be like us? Now, the fascinating dimension of this is that, of course, Western Europe, European um, democracy is about diversity. But there are certain kinds of diversity that are somehow undesirable, and as it happens, ours is one of these. I mean, I have put it that... Our problem is that, is that we're different without being exotic. You know, if you're exotic, you can be forgiven a great deal, but we're not exotic. We're sort of too like them, so maybe in Jungian terms, we are the shadow, we are the bad brother, the dark brother, but I don't want to take that argument too far. I would say a further problem here is the unreliable translators. What is it that gets through to the West? And who is it who's doing the translation? I'm not making a, a political point. I'm making much more a sociological and cultural point. I, my next point is simply two words, Larry Wolf. Now, I don't know how many of you know his book. Uh, he basically says that ever since the 18th century, the French Enlightenment, Voltaire, Diderot, and the others, constructed a Central Europe or an Eastern Europe that was its dark other. In other words, we are civilized, Paris, clearly, but if you want to contrast it civilized against what? Against what? Well, it's the hairy barbarians to the east. How far to the east? Oh, just, as, just as far as you like. And I believe that this particular uh, narrative is still there. Um, a particular problem of which I'm acutely conscious is that if we go back to the post-45 integration project, the, cent the central element of which, in my view, uh, is conflict resolution, this is increasingly overtaken and indeed to some extent marginalized by the discourse of human rights. Human rights are infinite and it's a moral statement. How can you create compromises when you have a discourse which says, no, 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 human rights are more significant than anything else? And that particular conflict between conflict resolution and human rights, I think, is a living problem uh, in, the, uh, in the relationship between what I'm calling the EU 15 and the EU 11. So basically, we're back to the asymmetries of power. And I think my pessimism, and I am pessimistic, uh, is that we've not been able to find the mutual language. We've not really been able to find the, the shared ideas on the basis of which we get the same status that we think we should have in the eyes of the EU15, the West, whatever you want to call it. Thank you very much. I think I've taken up my time.